Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's channeling showcase. And our guest today is Jessie Bayer. Welcome, Jessie. Thank you. <laughs> so Jessie owns uh, Serenity Intuitive, which is a spiritual healing and intuitive coaching practice in the Pacific Northwest. She is a certified spiritual life coach, coach a skilled animal communicator, and she's also trained as a facilitator in the Sedona method and as a medical intuitive and a channel in um, the School of Intuition, which is my psychic development school. Jessie's focus is helping people with things like spiritual awakening, soul healing, helping them raise their vibration and reconnect with their inner knowing because she wants to help others to be a shining soul, um, acting as beacons of light that help everyone else to do the same. So Jesse, before we go, we dive into the channeling, I really wanted to just ask you a few questions. Sure. And the first question is why channeling? Why is that something you were attracted to? Well, funny enough, I wasn't actually attracted to it. <laughs> <laughs> just sort of like medical intuition was something that uh, spirit sort of put in my path, as it were. Um, and as most of you know, you can only ignore spirit for so long before they uh, bring you around to what you're meant to be doing. So. Okay, you will let you will. So you were led by the nose <laughs> into doing yes. yes, and I'm very glad I was. And so you've been having, um, on the channeling course, you've been having some actually amazing experiences and channeling some a wide variety of amazing beings. And the one that you're going to channel for us today is called Ishnan. So tell us about Ishnan. Who is Ishnan insofar as you understand it? Um, yeah, so uh, when I first connected, uh, they told me that they are an Ascended Master. Um, most recent life on Earth would have been um, in the Mesopotamia area. Um, explains that they're where they lived was on the Red Sea um, and was a trading route. So they had access to Egyptian culture, Persian culture, Asian culture, um, and and a lot of those mystery schools. So yeah, I was gonna um, say that's quite the melting pot of all the the major um mm -hmm. Uh, spiritual teachings on the planet at that time wow mm -hmm. yep um and so now um is an ascended master uh funny enough didn't want to give me a name at first because said the name wasn't important uh what was important was the information but i said it's important to me to have a name uh so that was the name i was given which, interestingly enough, I guess in Sikh culture means um, cleansing. So, or healing waters. So, how has Ishnan helped you personally? Um, well, I just get a lot from the messages, uh, especially the one that I did in class. There was a lot of information there. And when... I'm channeling, I'm not always absorbing that information. It's only upon listening to it later that that I get a lot out of it. So um, so I haven't actually channeled them a lot, but um, but found a lot of what they had to say very um, poignant and exactly what people needed to hear. 
so yeah i'm i'm very excited to um have an interaction with ishnan before we do i'd just love to ask you one question about because you've been doing the the channeling course in the school of intuition mm -hmm. what's your favorite part of that how, how have you found that helpful for you well, I just love being in that high energy vibration um, that comes when you're channeling. And I've really enjoyed um, actually working with several new guides. So my master guide, but I've also um, forged quite a um, partnership with my channeling guide so um so that's fun so do you think channeling is something that everyone should do not is it not only is it something everyone should do it's something everyone can do so yes and actually does do <laughs> mm -hmm. because, um as we've discussed in the course we are all channeled entities we are all spirit and we have a body and, and I actually got a written message this morning from Ishnan before we started sort of addressing that. So. Interestingly enough, I was going to ask Ishnan about embodiments because that was something that came to me <laughs> before we started. So I guess it's a message that really wants to come through. So without further mm -hmm. ado, I'll invite you to get yourself into the channeling state and let me know when you're ready to begin. Okay, before we begin, though, I would like to read what oh, what he, yes. what they gave me. Sure. Um, uh, your wisdom and mine are no different. It's all universal knowledge accessible by every energet every energetic life force. It is not hidden, nor only for the special few, because everything is special, and as part of the one, has access to all, all the knowledge all the dimensions, all the realities, all the possibilities and outcomes. The only blocking, the only thing blocking all of the everything is your filter. All energy life forces have a filter. Yours is not only your unique filter, but also the filter of humanity. Collective humanity has chosen a filter with which to operate thus limiting what information can be comprehended. I love that very much. It's actually, it's very unifying. It's one of those messages that we need to listen to a few times to fully absorb, but very, very unifying. And I absolutely believe that that is true. And, you know, none of us is any more or less special than the other. And we all have access to all knowledge and information apart from the biases that we've um, put in place. Thank you uh, for sharing that, Jesse. Mm -hmm. So let's delve more deeply into Ishnan's wisdom. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, Ishnan, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I've got like a few different subject matters that I thought that we could talk about. And the first one is uh, something that I think Jesse was also keen on talking about, and that is ascension. So what is ascension? Ascension is merely a remembering. When you incarnate, you forget. You forget who you truly are. You forget your connectedness. So ascension, as you use the word, is merely a remembering of who you are and your place in the universe. Are we all ascending and do we have a choice? You always have choice. Free will is the second rule. Love is the first rule. Free will is the second rule. 
So you always have a choice. Think of ascension as a continuum. You're either stepping towards it or stepping away from it. And that can be in every moment. So yes, all people are ascending and all people are choosing not to ascend. It just depends on the moment that you're in. Yeah, I think you just answered another question I had, which I, I'll ask it anyway, which is, did we descend before we ascended and will we descend again? I think you, the answer to that is yes, from what you just said, but maybe you can expand on it. <laughs> you are correct, Leslie. I think it's more important that you think of it as a wheel. So a wheel has no beginning and no end. It merely is one continuous. And therefore, sometimes you're at the top of the wheel, sometimes you're at the bottom, sometimes in the middle, sometimes on the outer edges. And the wheels it's not a linear progression as humans like to think but rather a choice, a choice as to which dimension, possibility, or reality that you choose to, in that lifetime, in that moment. As you've spoken to your students about many times, all lifetimes are happening at once because all we have is this moment, the present. So in the present, you are all spots of the wheel at all times. It, they just present as different lifetimes. Does this help you understand? Yes, and um, I love the analogy of the wheel. I think it's a fantastic analogy. And Actually, it made me think of the Wheel of Fortune in the tarot deck, which I believe comes from ancient Egypt anyway. So the other thing it made me think of is almost like the ascension and descension is part of the natural pulse or the in and out breath of the universe, you know? It's like a natural rhythm. That's an excellent way to put it. It is the in and out breath of the universe. Yeah. Actually, it's the in and out breath of everything beyond the universe. The universe is merely a part of it. Thank you. Can we spin the wheel faster? Can we accelerate our ascension? And if so, should we? It's possible. However, as a human, I sense that you are trying to do the human thing, which is to skip the process or skip the steps. Everyone's ascension is happening exactly as it's supposed to, exactly in the time it's supposed to. And comparing yourself to others leads to this feeling of needing to accelerate it. Enjoy the space that you're in right now. Exactly. Because faster or slower isn't better or worse. Um, here's another question. Is ascension becoming more loving and is descension becoming more afraid? I believe that what you're asking is what role does love and fear play in ascension? That's a great Would that be a fair assumption? Yeah, I like the way you phrased it. Oneness, the whole, the void is all love. Love is the first rule. So everything is love. It's the filter of fear that creeps in. 
that per helps you perceive that you are descending and therefore becoming further from the one. The reality is that you are always part of the one. There cannot be separation. There is only love. And fear is merely a filter. So humans seem to have quite a well-established fear filter. Um, yes. Why does fear play such a big role in our reality? Why do we get so afraid? You are on earth for experiences and you always have free will. It is human nature to continue on the same path until it becomes uncomfortable. And only then do you make the choice for betterment or change in your minds. So fear is the tool that helps you choose betterment. So I know you want to make it something more, something bigger, something to be conquered, but it is merely a tool. So fear is a tool. And you said um, often we wait until the fear just gets so unbearably intense to make the change. So how can we learn to make the change sooner or should we? Everyone is on their own path. Some only need to see that taking a different path leads to a different outcome. And therefore they do not need to use the tool of fear. Others who are not awake or as awakened as you are calling, often need the fear of an outcome to make a different choice. For centuries and millennia, humanity has been oppressed through fear. So it is deeply ingrained that we should be in a fearful state. And it's only through spiritual practices such as meditation, prayer, and seeking inner guidance or discernment that you can stop living in the fear and see it as the tool that it is for change. So you observe humans on this earth in our present time reality from what we're the conversation we're having now what are the most common both conscious and unconscious fears that you observe in humanity the biggest fear that has been here since the dawn of time is the fear of being alone. This is the primal fear. This is the fear that causes you to believe there is separation, that there is other and self. The other fear that we see is the fear of not being enough, of not being the perfection that you are. And lastly, we see fear of 
your own magnificence. And this fear causes people to try and control others' experiences. It causes people to stay stuck in the belief that they are helpless. And it causes them not to see the love that is all around them, available in infinite supply to every energetic life force, always and forever. So let's talk about loneliness. Because I think we, we could, all, could all agree there is a loneliness epidemic on our planet right now and people do feel separate from one another and separate or disconnected from source. And I think you explained a little bit about why that is, but what can we do about it? Instead of answering your question, I will answer your question, but instead I tend to pose a question to you. Is there actually anything wrong with that? I think that we humans feel uncomfortable with certain emotions. We feel very comfortable with the emotions on the positive end of the emotional spectrum. And we feel uncomfortable with more negatively uh, polarized emotions. And so I guess ultimately the answer to your question is no, there's nothing wrong with it. But we feel so uncomfortable, we want to bypass it and we want to avoid feeling it. Correct. But it's that uncomfortableness where I will use your word ascension begins one must be uncomfortable in order to change so this loneliness it's the original sin is here to help you do the very thing that you chose as spirit before you incarnated on this planet. And that is to be know your true self and know the true oneness of the universe. And therein is a segue to the next great fear, the fear of not being good enough. And I think I'm yet to meet a human being who doesn't, have a fear of not being good enough so where does the unworthiness come from and also and I, and I get in a way the same answer that you know we need to sit with these um, feelings and fully accept them in order to change but where does our unworthiness come from and is there any other wisdom to help us master that experience that you could offer? Part of the reason for the un feelings of unworthiness is because your religions have taught you that you are unworthy. It is a systematic programming, if you will, in order to control. Instead of realizing that God is in you, God is everywhere, and you are not separate, 
religions have tried to control by taking away the very message that every prophet has tried to convey throughout millennia. As frustrating as that may be, it is now part of the human filter. And those who are awakening or ascending are starting to see that this is not true, are starting to see that they are enough. But that's many, many millennia of programming to overcome. And we are always here to help. We are always here to assist. And we are always here to send the love. The love that you know means that you are exactly enough. You are exactly perfection. Exactly perfection in your imperfection. And that's what makes you special. Thank you. The third um, fear that you told us about was fear of our own power and our own magnificence, which is the flip side of the unworthiness. And you, you did uh, give us quite a lot of information about that already. So, and I, I think that there's a misunderstanding about power and what power is for the same reasons you've been talking about, which is that power is misconstrued to be something you do to manipulate and control others and that you need to do that in order to be okay. So we don't realize that true power is in knowing the self, being in balance within the self, and expressing our true self, our authentic nature. So one of the things that's bandied about a lot in modern spiritual circles is this word authenticity. So what does it mean to be authentic and to live authentically? I think that there is a human whose life may give you a good example of that. And that would be Gandhi. Gandhi had no power politically or otherwise, yet became very well known. And Gandhi lived an authentic life, knowing who and what he was at all times. And that allowed him to make real change, real change in the world. I could tell you many ways to do it, but often humans need the example of one who's lived that way before. So I encourage you, if you are still questioning how to be in your power, look to the life of Gandhi. That is a beautiful example. And we definitely see through that example, one human who helped many other humans and helped change the world. So being our authentic selves is the best way that we can contribute to our planet and to our fellow humans. And yet, 
probably most of us continue to lie to ourselves about who we are, about who others are. And we remain in denial of the true self. So can you comment on why it's so hard for us to be authentic? And you've probably given us a lot of reasons of all the fears and things, but help us understand in a bit more depth. I've spoken about filters, and yet I don't think you fully grasp my meaning. Not being honest with oneself is a filter. Not wanting to deal with, in your words, the layers is a filter. It allows for the illusion to continue. And again, no problem, because everyone will reach it in their own time. Some may not reach it in this lifetime, and that is okay. Some will get very far along the path in this lifetime, and again, that is okay. And some will reach full realization, authenticity, and become bodies of light. You are not meant to do it all in one lifetime. You are not meant to strip away all illusions all at once. This would be far too much for the mind and the body. And this is why it appears to be a gradual process on your planet. That is not to say that some don't do it in an instant. But those souls are rare. I guess my best advice to you would be don't be so hard on yourself and enjoy the ride. So you mentioned mind and body. And so I want to ask you about both of those things. One of the, another kind of word that spiritual circles have clasped onto very recently, although spiritual masters have been teaching this for thousands of years, is the word embodiment. I don't know that everybody using that word really understands the true meaning of embodiment. So can you explain what does it mean to be embodied and why is it important? Embodiment is simple, yet difficult to grasp. Embodiment is merely you as an energetic life force inhabiting a body and mind on this planet. There are many energetic life forces that have no body. There are many that have no mind. But on this planet, there is the trifold of mind, body, and spirit. And you've chosen this because it does help you accelerate some learning. Yet many of you walk around I would say, to use one of your phrases, on autopilot, where the soul is disengaged from the body and the mind, 
or the mind is disengaged from the soul and the body, or the body is disengaged from the mind and the soul, or any combination of the three. So to be truly embodied is to be in balance with all three. And as we've spoken before, this is accomplished through spiritual practice, meditation, prayer, contemplation. So what can you do in a human body that you can't do otherwise? And I, I ask that question because I think a lot of spiritual seekers seek to move out of the body rather than more deeply into the body and miss the point of having a body at all so any for anybody listening to this how, what explain to them what they can do in their body that is not possible to do in a disembodied state the body allows you to have the experience of other. It allows you to experience touch, taste, emotions. It allows you to feel the bark of a tree, the wind on your face to taste the salt of the sea and ice cream. It allows you to walk upon the earth and feel the energetic vibrations through your feet. It allows for a wealth of sensations that would not be possible in a purely energetic form. And through that, you can understand all the possibilities. I believe there's a saying on your planet, if you can think it, you can be it. And this is true, we can all manifest. But it's on a, the rare planets such as Earth where you get to actually have the sensation of touch, the feeling of hunger, the feeling of having a strong body or a weak body and being able to move around and interact on a physical level with your environment. These things are not possible when you are in your energetic state alone. You. do you also agree that if you have a physical body and a physical life and you are wanting to create on a physical level that it is the embodiment that allows you to magnetize that into your reality into your physical reality very good leslie you are correct Thank you. So, I want to talk about mind and another epidemic on our planet is a ment the mental illness epidemic. So many people are struggling with different forms of mental illness and I guess this is a wide net to cast because we've labeled many different, um, we've given many different labels to different manifestations of mental illness. But I wonder if you could talk to us about mental illness um, and maybe start in a general way and then see where the conversation takes us. Of course, as I mentioned before, 
there is a filter of humanity. Many on your planet now who are diagnosed with mental illness have actually rejected the standard human filter. And in rejecting the standard human filter, are able to perceive the wider range of what is possible, thus overwhelming their mind and their body. So those you call delusional really should be reframed because they see the things that humanity has chosen to filter out. Yeah. So I I actually do understand that. And um and then that sort of begs the question but they are what do you do with that? Because they are in they are in a body on earth. So A should we be helping them to accept the biases so that they can live on earth in that way? Or B, should we be having our minds blown wide open by what they are able to perceive and what the majority is not? Or something in between? I love you humans. You want everything to be black and white, A or B. I gave you in between. <laughs> you did give me in between. Um, many of, of those who you deem mentally ill now, and there are many, are here now to help you see that there are more possibilities. We would say that you should approach everyone, whether they are mentally ill or not, with the same compassion and care that you give to small children for Humanity is kindest to the smallest of children. And as people age, you become more demanding and harsh. So if you want to help those who you deem need help, then treat them with the compassion you would a child. Treat yourselves with the compassion you would of a child. Dare we say, treat everyone with the compassion you would of a child. Yes. While you were talking, I mean, I was thinking, you know, there are so many people who, you know, as they... I mean, we are all able to access multidimensional information. One label we give to that is being psychic. And there are many people who are awakening to their spiritual abilities. And if they're in the right place in the right time, there's someone who can help them understand what it is. And if they're in the inverted commas wrong place at the wrong time, they can be labeled and diagnosed with a mental illness when really they're just opening to their multidimensional nature. Correct. So let's shift tack a little bit and talk about another common theme we seem to be covering common themes that uh, people talk about in spiritual circles. That seems to be our overall theme today. 
So another one is this thing that we say is, you know, the new earth, when it's part of this ascension thing, we're moving to the new earth. So I'd like to ask you three questions about it, actually. I'll read them all together. What's your explanation of the new earth? What are some misunderstandings that we have as humans about the new earth? And what is the current status of this shift as we speak in this moment? I will answer the second question first. The fallacy that you humans have around this is that you see everything as linear. A to B to C to D to E. When in reality, much like I said before, you can imagine it as a wheel with no beginning and no end. You can imagine it instead as a ladder, although the ladder is also a linear form of thought. The earth has merely moved into a different vibration as part of its progression on the wheel. And when that happens, all life forms that inhabit her also move into this shift in energetic vibration. Some are ready for it, some are not. But that energetic shift does not happen as a step would for a person. It is more like a pendulum, with one end of the pendulum being the old vibration, and the very other extreme of the pendulum being the new vibration. And as such, she swings back and forth, back and forth. And that can be very jarring to a species that has chosen to define things linearly. A follow on question. Um, but before I pose that to you, I'm going to ask. If any members of the audience have a question for Ishnan, can you type it in the chat now? Because we're nearing the end of our discussion and um, I'm going to have a follow on question, which is, it's about a paradox that I've noticed. And the paradox is this. There are some spiritual teachers who say, okay, you're at the bottom of the pendulum. <laughs> um, and in that space of the bottom of the pendulum, you're, you're suffering, you're in pain, you're in fear, um, and you're dealing you know, with trauma of some kind. So now you have to work your way through layer by layer by layer by layer you know, re-experience re these things in order to free yourself from them. And then you have other spiritual teachers who say, it's simply a vibration and you can shift the dominant vibration instantly, like shifting yourself from one reality to another reality. And so you do not have to go through painstaking healing process. You just need to completely blink on a new reality. That seems paradoxical to the human mind. I I can see a way in which both are, are true, but I'm curious what, what you have to say about that. As you know, I have been on your planet. And in my life, the first way was the way. There are now 
people on your planet where the second way is the way. And this is where discernment comes. No one way is the only way. There are as many ways as there are people on your planet. And since we've talked about this linear thinking and a pendulum, it is possible for someone to do both. They may need in a particular moment to suffer. And in another moment, they need merely to shift their perspective. So neither way is right, neither way is wrong. The key to ascension is to find the way that's right for you. I'm going to use the example of Goldilocks. Goldilocks tried the papa bear's bed and it was too big and the mama bear's bed and it was too soft. And then she found the just right bed. And I say this as a way for you to give yourselves permission to experiment. You may find that one way works for you one day and another way works for you another. And there is no judgment around which was right and which was wrong, merely accept that whatever worked for you in that moment was exactly what was supposed to work for you in that moment. And what's working for you in the next moment is exactly what's meant to work for you in the next moment. I have a question from Tracy, and Tracy's question for you is, in what ways are you helping humanity raise its consciousness level? Well, one way is by having this conversation with you people today. I am always available as part of my journey is to be of service to humanity. And while I no longer have a physical form, I continue to aid and assist whomever asks for help. I help by giving information such as in this conversation. I help by just being with a soul when it's feeling lost. There is no limit to the ways that I can help, but I may only help when asked. Thank you, Ishnan. And I assume you are available to help all souls on earth. Correct. So I have two final questions. Oh, maybe three because <laughs> Amanda has actually given a question. So I'll read Amanda's question next. What is one way you suggest working with ego-based illusions? Again, I see many spiritual teachers saying that you must eradicate the ego. But again, as a human, you are given an ego. It serves a purpose in this planetary vibration. And it is a tool, just like the
Yes, just like fear is a tool. Ishnan was explaining that fear is a tool. It looks like uh, Jesse's connection has been lost. Uh, Welcome back, Leslie. <laughs> Maybe I didn't want to hear the answer to that one. 